Well, it's certainly a privilege to be here this morning. I hope we can cough our way through this one. And uh, thank you for gracing me with this great privilege. When you come to Africa, everybody wants to see the big five. That's the elephant and the lion and the rhino and the buffalo and the leopard. And if you haven't seen the big five, then you haven't seen anything. And why does everybody want to see the big five? Well, the big five are sort of exciting. And uh, there's an element of danger attached to the big five. And there's a, a regal aspect and power attached to the big five. And if you've ever been chased for a kilometer by an elephant, then you will know that there is an element of fear and respect associated with these creatures. So those are the big five. And when you look at a lion, have you ever been charged by a lion? I don't think anyone in Canada has been charged by a lion, have they? I was just recently in Africa and a portion of our group was charged by a lion. That's a very scary experience. Because when a lion charges, you don't run. If you run, you end up dead. Then you are prey. When a lion charges, you get up, you stand like this, and you look him in the eye. And he'll charge up to there, if you're lucky, and stop, and growl, and turn around, and walk away. If you've survived that moment, you're fine. <laughs> if you haven't, you're dead, and you don't know about it anymore. Buffalo is incredibly dangerous and unpredictable, as are rhinoceros and elephant. And a leopard, if a leopard ever charges you and you stand up and you look him in the eye, you're dead. You don't look a leopard in the eye. When a leopard is around, you make a noise. You go bong, bing, bong, whatever. But you never look at him. You always look away. And you never move fast, and you just sort of walk away. So everyone has his own character. Everyone is unique. And everyone teaches a lesson about God. A lion has something regal about him. It's not for nothing that they've made him the king of the beasts. He is powerful. He is, well, regal is the best word that you can come up with. A leopard is Gorgeous, sleek, blends with the environment. And these creatures can teach us so much about God. But I don't want to talk about these big five. I want to talk about a totally different big five. And the big five I want to talk today about today is the big five questions that govern life on this planet. Because they can teach us far more than the big five can. And they are far more thrilling than anything that anything the world has to offer. And the big five are, where do I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? Why is the planet in the mess that it's in? And what is the solution? Those are the big five questions. And every single one of these questions is a science on its own. It is a huge discipline of science that involves itself with every one of these questions. And none of them seem to come up with the right answers if you don't use the guidebook. If you don't have the manual, you get lost in these five questions. Everybody knows that man is inherently inquisitive. And we're dealing with young people here. They're inquisitive. And modern schooling systems, I'm sad to say, 
are not geared to deal with the inquisitive mind. Modern schooling systems are geared to indoctrinate and mold and shape according to the pattern which some believe they need to dictate. God's way was always different. God's way was to learn and to experience by curiosity. And children are born with a natural curiosity. And parents have the privilege of filling that natural curiosity. I mean, the first question the child will ask when he gets to an age when he can ask questions is, where do I come from? Normally you say, go and ask your mother. And the mother will think about it and um and on says, I think you should ask your father. And when they come to you, you say, well, you're the result of a myotic replicative process that ended up in the recombinant, which is you. And the kid will look at you and say, excuse me, what does that mean? I think you should ask your mother. <laughs> Isn't that where we go? So where do I come from? Now there's a whole science that deals with where do we come from. And it's divided up into categories so that various individuals can become involved in the study. And when it comes down to the matter, we call it quantum physics. And if it comes to the biological process, <laughs> we call it phylogeny, or call it evolution, or whatever you would like to call it. Now, quantum mechanics is a fascinating field of study. Have you ever thought about the creation week? Have you ever thought about God saying on the first day, let there be light? That's what he said. Let there be light. And then the next season it was morning and it was evening, the first day. When it comes to the sixth day, God created all the animals that are on the planet. Every single one that is on the terrestrial plane. Not the sea creatures and the flying creatures, but all the terrestrial animals, including the big five. He created them all. And if you look at the intricacy and the biology of all these creatures from the nematodes, to the annelids, to the worms, to the mammals, the reptiles, the frogs, each one so intricate, so complex. And at the end of that, he created Adam and Eve. And then they named all the animals, and then he introduced himself. Isn't that quite a process on the sixth day? What was the first day about? Let there be light. Now, excuse me, in my little pea brain, I think to myself, what's the big deal? Why did it take a whole day for God to put light into effect? If it only took him a day to create all the animals, all the nuances, all the intelligence, everything that has to deal and feel, and all the complexity of, of, of the animal and human kingdom, psych and mind, and everything that goes with it. And he said, let there be light. Well, quantum physics tells us why light is such a a big deal. Light is the basis of everything. Without light, there is nothing. And God came to this world, and the world was in darkness. Have you thought why this world should have been in darkness? Why would the world be in darkness? And in the midst of the darkness, God said, let there be light. And it was so. And God separated the light from the darkness. 
Now, where was the devil when God created this world? Probably down here, right? And therefore it was darkness because the absence of God is darkness. Because the Bible tells us that God is light. Doesn't it say so? So the absence of God must be darkness. So in the middle of the darkness, God says, let there be light. Okay. So what was God going to do with the darkness? God was going to dispel the darkness with the light. But what is the point of dispelling the darkness with the light if there isn't something to carry the light? And who's going to represent the light and how is the darkness going to be overcome by the presence of light? Now the physicists look at light and they're confused. Because when you break it down to its, its components, then light consists of photons. Photons. Now what is photon? Well, photon is a unit. Well, is it a particle? What is it? Well, obviously, it has an effect. You can bounce it against a receiving structure like they're doing right now there in the back in those cameras and it has an effect <laughs> to such an extent that it changes the chemistry of what's happening in that receiver at the end there and will be recorded and can be displayed. So it, it does have an effect. But then they started to say, well, is it, what is it? Is it, is it something or is it, is it not something? And they look at it and study it and then those famous experiments where they break it down in their mega equipment that they build, their accelerators, where they can study the subparticles individually, and the best scientific minds have been enthralled with the subject of light and never figured it out up until this day. Because the question is, where do we come from? Where do we come from? And so they take a photon and they shoot it, and they have a, at the other end a target with a hole. And the photon goes through the hole and you can see the light and it affects the screen and it makes its mark. Aha. Then they take that same one photon or they take one and they shoot it through two holes. And it goes through two holes. And they put three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, a hundred holes, and they take one photon and they shoot it through a hole and it goes through all of them. There's something wrong here. So, is it a substance? Does it have matter? Or is it a wave? Or what is it? Well, it's a substance because you can measure it, but it's also a wave. So maybe it's there, or maybe it's not. So what are atoms? What are atoms? What do they consist of? Well, they, they consist of, we tell the students, they consist of neutrons, and they consist of protons, and they consist of electrons. Yeah, but what do they consist of? Well, they, they consist of, if you look at the neutron and you look at the proton, they consist of quarks. Okay, what's a quark? It's a combination of hadrons. What, what's that? Well, if you break it all down, the electron doesn't consist of quarks, but the proton and the neutron consist of quarks. How many quarks? Three quarks. What's a quark? Well, if you break down a quark, oh, yeah, there are up quarks and down quarks, and probably left quarks and right quarks and round quarks and whatever quarks. And when you break them down, they break down to a photon. And the photon is what? Is light. Now, is light matter? Or is light a wave? Does it exist or does it not exist? Of course it exists. We're recording it. So they want to know what it, what it consists of. What is it? Please help us. What is it? 
And this is how the Big Bang Theory was born. And of course it was proposed by infidels. It was proposed by George Lemaitre, 1931, who was a Jesuit priest and a physicist. And it is being taught throughout the world as the very origin of everything that we know. Where do we come from? We come from the Big Bang. Now what was the Big Bang? The Big Bang was an explosion. Of what? <laughs> well done. In November 2014, that's the end of last year, Pope Francis said, the Big Bang is real. God is not a magician with a magic wand. And according to the tabloids, that put an end finally to the pseudoscience that we come from a creator God. Interesting. Einstein said, as far as the laws of mathematics refer to reality, they are not certain. And as far as they uh, but are certain, they do not refer to reality. In other words, what's he saying? He doesn't say, I don't know what the heck's going on. That's what he's saying. Now the famous physicist, Mikio Kaku, the Japanese quantum physicist, he has something interesting to say. He say, we do this because we want to understand our role in the universe. Why are we here? And all these people are atheists. Or Hawkins. He just recently admitted, because his family member had a near-death experience, that some form of deity must be involved, and he calls it a God factor. And the physicist Lawrence Krauss, he's a personal friend, by the way, of Richard Dawkins, who hates God with a passion, says, contrary to logic, it is not just probable that we get something out of nothing, it is absolutely inevitable. We have to get something out of nothing. Now, excuse me, why do we have to get something out of nothing? Because we are here. And his friend, Richard Dawkins, says in the book, The Blind Watchmaker, that the probability of us coming into existence by chance is so infinitesimally small that it is, for all practical purposes, non-existent, but that's irrelevant. Because it happened, we're here. So it doesn't matter what the probability are, is, we're here. Okay. So we're here. And what did we come from? As they said, from absolutely nothing. Because if you compress all matter down, eventually you come to an interchangeable photon in an exist and a non-exist stage, which exists of absolutely nothing. And if we look at an atom, which consists eventually in its subcomponents of quarks, and it consists of absolutely nothing, then why does it have weight? Because everything that's in the atom, if you add it all up, weighs x. But the whole atom weighs infinitely more than x, so the nothing actually weighs more than the something, which consists of nothing. That's quantum physics. Quantum physics is the confusion of where does everything come from and how is it inevitable that it should come from nothing. And when we say God created everything ex nihilo, then we, according to them, are insane. What is the absolute insanity? To believe that nothing by chance came through nothing to everything. That must be the absolute insanity. And even if you believe all of these things, 
the where do I come from, is all tied in, even according to quantum physics, to light. It's the basis of everything. And the greatest minds on earth cannot figure it out. We are quantums of light in a world of darkness. Let there be light. What an incredible statement. What an incredible statement. So why are we here? Why are we here? Isaiah chapter 43. And let's go there to verse 7. And it says, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory. Go to Isaiah chapter 42, verse 12. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise in the coastlands. Why are we here? According to the scriptures. To give glory to God. How do you give glory to God? What is glory? What is glory? What does it mean to give glory to God? Why am I here? I'm supposed to be light. I'm constructed of photons. I am nothing that becomes everything by the voice and the word of God. That's incredible. And I'm here to be a photon in a world of darkness. I want to read you from the Spirit of Prophecy. Those who take Christ at his word and surrender their souls to his keeping, their lives to his ordering, will find peace and quietude. Nothing of the world can make them sad when Jesus makes them glad by his presence. In perfect acquiescence, there is perfect rest. The Lord said, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Because he trusteth in thee. Isaiah 26 verse 3. Our lives may seem a tangle, but as we commit ourselves to the wise master worker, he will bring out the pattern of life and character that will be to his own glory. Why were we created? For God's glory. And what does that mean? And that character which expresses the glory is the character of Christ. Isn't that beautiful? I'll read you another one. Before men and angels, Satan has been revealed as man's enemy and destroyer. The Bible calls him darkness. Darkness means the absence of light. Christ as man's friend and deliverer. His spirit will develop in man all that will ennoble the character and dignify the nature. What was this earth like? When God spoke and said, let there be light. Didn't the Bible call it an abusos? And darkness, abyss, primordial chaos. No order, no structure, no quark. Triad of quark, up quark, down quark, photon, nothing. And then it says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. He has called us to the obtaining of the glory, the character of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
So the question, why am I here? How do we answer it? For one purpose, and one purpose alone. To be a light. To be a unit, a photon. And every single thing I consist of breaks down according to quantum physics to units of light. So you were designed to be beings of light. And what a privilege that the God of the universe should place this new creation into the midst of darkness. Why? Because it was to destroy the darkness forever. Isn't that a high calling? Isn't that a high calling? Unbelievable calling. It boggles the mind. Isaiah chapter 58. You all know this one. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Isn't this what we have to do? Verse 6. What is the kind of fast I have chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness? To dispel darkness. To undo the heavy burdens. To let the oppressed go free. And that you break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry spiritually? And to cover the naked with the righteousness of Christ? Then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily. And your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rare God. Are you beginning to see something in these verses? Why we were placed on this planet? To represent the character of God, we were created ex nihilo out of nothing. That is not scientific idiocy anymore. That is scientific eloquence. In spite of what the great atheistic brains of this world are saying. They're actually going so far now as to say that the God factor will eventually destroy this planet. And they are preparing for a great destruction which will come at the speed of light. I have news for them. It will come at the speed of thought. So why am I here? There are so many beautiful things in the Bible. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. We always think that this has to do with man who becomes old. But we're talking to young people today. So let's look at a double application. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth. Young people, wise up, listen. Before the difficult days come, and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are not darkened. And the clouds do not return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble. And the strong men bow down when the grinders cease because they are few. And those that look through the window grow dim when the doors are shut in the street. And it tells us there, when the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper is a burden 
and desire fails. Talking about old age and what happens to each and every one individually. But it's also talking about our world that will grow old. And it will come to the time when the Lord says we will have no pleasure in these days, when the sun and the light and the moon and the stars will be darkened. Did that happen in the history? Was there a dark day? Did the stars fall, yes or no? We're dealing with dates and times. And the keepers of the house will tremble. Who are the keepers of the house? God's people in the church. They will tremble. And the grinders cease because they are few. More and more people are turning to fables and atheism. And a school like this needs to represent light. A school like this needs to be a beacon in a world of darkness where the keepers of the house tremble and when the grinders cease because there's no more grain, no more spiritual food to feed anyone and they cease and the doors are shut. Did the spirit of prophecy tell us that the doors will be shut at the end of time? Yes or no? You will not be able to access the houses. Remember your creator before the silver cord is loosed. I was always fascinated by that verse because when I was in the occult world, I'm sure you will remember, there was much talk about the silver cord that attaches the soul to the physical entity. Well, the occult world doesn't know that the physical entity is nothing other than a photon, which is a nothingness of light. So actually we all consist of nothing. Therefore a soul cannot be less or more nothing than nothing. There's no such thing. What is the silver cord that binds us? Silver is a symbol of obedience. It is the separation of the good from the dross. And by the silver cord of obedience we are attached to one source. And that source is God. And that's why he comes and eventually the preacher sought to find acceptable words, verse 10, and what was written was upright, words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads and the words of scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. Who are we supposed to be attached to with a silver cord? To Christ. Let us hear the conclusion of the matter. Young people, listen up. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment. You are photons of light. And that is why you are here. You are here to represent the character of the God of the universe. We are not old-fashioned. We are on the forefront of scientific endeavor. We are way ahead of quantum physics. And we are in a world of darkness. So where am I going? Where am I going to end up? What is the message I have to tell people? Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the duty of man. And one day I want to stand at the tree of life. Revelation chapter 22, verse 14. Here are they that have keep the commandments that will have a right to the tree of life. You either stand at the tree of life one day on a sea of glass mingled with fire, or else you get thrown into another fire, which is the second death. What happens when an atom explodes? That's a lot of energy that's released. It's called a nuclear explosion. It's even more powerful when you fuse two atoms. That's called nuclear fusion. But that's just the splitting of the atom. What if you release the energy of a quark? 
unbelievable. Nobody can even imagine the energy that will be released when you change and destroy quarks into what they were originally. A fire will come out and consume them. It will be the most destructive force this universe has ever witnessed. Nobody knows how quarks are held together in threes. What are the forces that hold it together? Because if they should be released, the energy is so enormous it would obliterate everything in its presence. Who holds everything together? God. By the word of his mouth. Now they call this matter that is no matter, that is nothing, that is holding them together, they call it dark matter or they call it the God factor. But they don't believe in God. What is our duty in this world? We're supposed to keep stuck together. If you keep together, you are alive. If you're not together, you're dead. If we don't have a connection with Christ, if his word does not sustain us, we will end up in a fiery explosion. And they even say that. It is astounding when you read what the modern physicists say and you compare it with the book of Revelation. It's unbelievable. Why are we in the mess that we are in? And why would we want to stay connected to Christ? Because you're not just a connection of photons. Yes, you consist of photons. But you are to represent the character of God, which is represented by his face, to see the face of God. I wonder what it will be like in heaven to see the face of God and to see wisdom unfold itself for all eternity and the mind's capacity to be able to grasp it. Has there ever been a mind on this planet that has said, disc full? Reformat. No. What is the capacity of your mind? It's endless. It's endless. There's no such structure that has ever been designed by humanity. They think they're so clever because they construct a computer and a hard drive. There's nothing like this hard drive. Have you ever thought, ah, the thing has gone from me. I cannot remember it. What was that person's name again? And then you say, ah, forget it. And then you're talking half a day, and suddenly you say, ha, it was. Do you remember that? Has it happened to you? Now what happened there? You have sent an impulse to your mind and said, Retrieve file so-and-so. This is what it looks like. You have a picture in your brain written in RNA and retrieve it. So now the genetics continue to search at the tags which have been created all while you are not even aware of it and boom, it comes up. Now what if that process were undisturbed and no matter what you thought, or no matter what you saw, or no matter what you learned, you'd never forget it. Wouldn't that be great? That's the unfallen mind. They didn't have books in the antediluvian world. I cannot wait to be in heaven if all these great scientists, if Einstein said, I cannot wait to see the face of God. Does he know what he was saying? 
Because the faith stands for his character. Does he want to see the character of God if he denies his existence? I want to save these people. And you should want to save them too. Why are we in this mess that we are in? As one person said, I was talking to one person the other day who became an atheist after knowing the truth for years. He says he cannot reconcile this world view of Christianity with a world where the children are dying, where the children are suffering, where some of them are starving to death, Surely there was another way of dealing with this. Surely an omnipotent God could have solved this problem without having the children die. And therefore he doesn't want to be with God even if he should exist. Now I'm sure that God has thought this thing through. And I'm sure God has looked at the children that are dying But why did he let the children die? Because we serve a God who didn't take that thought lightly. We serve a God who took the consequences upon himself. But he didn't only take the consequences in terms of, oh, I feel so sorry for you. He took the consequences of being you. That means that the God of the universe who said, let there be light, decided to take the consequences in their fullness, not only for you, but as you, to the cross. That's phenomenal. Why would he do that? Because righteousness and justice have to meet each other. Darkness is the absence of the character of God. Light is the presence of the character of God. And God had for us, has he encoded his character. Now young people, what's that called? That encoding of the character of God. His commandments. Fear God and give glory to him for this is the whole duty of man. So here is the character of God encoded and only within that framework of that encoding can life in peace and rest exist. Outside it, it cannot exist. If anybody chooses to break the code, I don't want my DNA. Well, then you won't exist if you don't want your DNA. I don't want to pass my DNA on to my posterity. Well, then you won't have children. It's a law of biology. In the same way, if you don't want the Ten Commandments, you don't qualify as photons of light. And if you don't qualify as photons of light, you cannot exist. It's as simple as that. So if someone says, I don't want it, it's the same as saying, I don't want to exist. And if God doesn't force anyone, then you cease to exist. He says, let the photon go back to nothingness. And that's what happens. So this thing called sin came into the world and God permitted it for a reason. Now this atheist said to me, why would he do it? Was there no better way? Couldn't he have just have stopped him? Well, what if you are a loving parent and the other parent goes rogue, becomes an evil, evil monster with a warped mind and a bent character. And what if that individual hijacks 
your children one day, abducts them, and infuses them with his character, and turns you against, and turns the children against the loving, kind parent. So that they see it totally from his perspective. Well, the loving, kind parent can say, I'm going to take the evil bent one out. <clears throat> what will be the reaction of the children if they have adopted his view? You will have just proved that you are the monster in the story. And so, you cannot take them out, take him out because you're going to lose your children. They're going to hate you even more. So what's the only other solution? Demonstrate your love with the hope, if you grant them freedom of choice, with the hope that they will see it and understand it. It's your only chance. And then when the point has come where everybody has made their decision, then you can end it. And this is why we are in the mess that we are in. And the only solution, what is the solution? The last of the big five is written in the name of the Creator God. That's the only solution. There is no other name under heaven and earth whereby you can be saved except the name Christ Jesus. Because he's the one who is the light. He's the one who holds it together. And the blueprint of life is written in his law. Now I want to ask these atheist scientist friends of mine, why is it that they are willing to be atheists and to discard God, but they embrace beauty, they embrace relationships, they embrace all the capacity of the human psyche, but they deny the source. I want to ask you, why would a creation or an existence like this be based on relationships? I see many relationships here. I see husband and wife relationships. How would you like to have a wife that you could never see, never touch, never experience? Isn't everybody geared to looking into the face of the one they have a relationship with, yes or no? Isn't that so? What do you want to see, the back of the head or do you want to see the face? If you're in love with someone, do you want to say, turn around, I want to see your back, or do you want to see, I want to look into your eyes? What do you want to do? What mother wants a child with no relationship? What is, a, what is a, a family without relationship? What about the feelings of a mother to a child, a father to a child, a mother to a husband, a brother to a sister, a sister to a brother? Isn't the whole of humanity based on relationships, yes or no? Then why should we have a diffuse God who's not in relationship? It's the most ironic idea, most pathetic, warped concept of God. If God is not the God of a relationship, then he's not worth having. Buddhism doesn't have a personal God. And other religions that have a personal God have such a tyrant that you're so afraid of him you wouldn't want to be anywhere near him. Let there be light. Let's represent this God, this God of love, this God of kindness. What is the solution? The solution lies in a person. 
The solution lies in a person who has demonstrated his character. I want to turn you to turn to Second Peter. Chapter 1. This is about such a fantastic little piece. And let's read from verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. If we don't have knowledge, if we don't understand how it's put together, we will never put the story together. As his, div as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life. Do you see where we're going? This is the God we're talking about. All things from the photon up to the relationship that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory. Are you getting it? Representing a character and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. How did he create you? In whose image did he create you? In his. He created you in his image. That means in his character. That means in his light. That through these you may be partakers. What a fabulous verse of the divine nature. You can partake in this character of light. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue. If you have faith in God, that's not enough. You have to add virtue. You have to change. You have to become good if you were bad. You have to add virtue. And to virtue you add knowledge. And to knowledge you add self-control. And God will make you bump your head on more than one occasion so that you can learn self-control. And to self-control, perseverance. Never, ever, ever give up, young people. If you get knocked over, get up. If they knock you over again, get up again. To perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. And the word he uses there is agapeo. And that's amazing, because when Jesus confronted him after he had denied him, he said to him, do you love me, agapeo, agape, if you like, and he said, I phileo you. I don't get there. I cannot do this agape thing. Do you agape on me? I'm sorry, I'm only capable of phileo. And Jesus comes down to his level. Do you phileo me? And he says, you know that I phileo you. But this selfless love, I've demonstrated my weakness. But here he goes in Peter's ladder, and he says, grow. Climb the ladder, grow, and you will eventually get to where God wants you to be. Selfless love. Isaiah chapter 6, last verse, and I'll put you out of your misery. And let's read from verse... Oh, why not read it? Okay. This is Isaiah's vision of God. And chapter 6, it says, In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And there he saw the seraphim, the angels, 
And they were shouting, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. They were describing his character. And the posts of the door were shaken. And Isaiah looked at himself and he compared himself to this beautiful character of God. This embodiment of the blueprint of what makes life possible. And he says, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the king. I'm going to be dead. My photons are going to shoot apart. My quarks are disintegrating within me. And then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. So he wasn't perfect. He was pathetic. He was a man of unclean lips living amongst the people of unclean lips, just like we all are. But if we allow God to touch us, with a burning coal because God is a consuming fire. What will happen? He'll purge that sin. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Plural. And then he pipes up, Isaiah, and he says, Here am I. Send me. This is what I want to tell you, young people. We are not chosen because we're better than anyone else. We're probably more pathetic than anyone else. We're not chosen because we're more brilliant than anyone else because these great scientists out there are brilliant. God calls them fools. Doesn't he? Doesn't he say the fool says within his heart there is no God? So you are little photons of light living in a world of darkness that have swallowed the darkness because we have all fallen short of the glory of God. And here is the God of the universe saying to you, let me touch your lips. Your sins have been purged. And then he calls out into the void out there, whom shall we send? Who will go for us? What does that mean? Who will represent the God of the universe to humanity? And the man who just said, whoa, I'm a man of unclean lips, says, send me. My question are you going to say the same? Are you going to say, Lord, I'm pathetic, but send me? Are you going to do it? If we can do that, then we will have fulfilled the purpose of why we are here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a privilege to be photons of light in the midst of darkness. What a privilege to be touched by the God of the universe that transforms feeble, sinful people into heralds of the great I Am. Help us to be partakers of the divine nature and help us to rightly represent you. In Jesus' name, amen.